I now will hand over the session to Professor Rao to conduct the session. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to chair this session. And we have a, uh, a very important paper on distribution neutral fiscal policy with distortionary taxes and transfers. Um, obviously, taxes and transfers do involve distortions. Um, of course, there are many other things that, that involve distortions as well. Uh, I'm sure um, I mean, this will be a, a very theoretical paper, and I'm sure we'll, after lunch we'll be geared to a, a, <laughs> a theoretical, theoretical paper. Shugata, Professor Shugata Marjit um, is, uh, as I was mentioned, um, is a Reserve Bank of India professor of Industrial Economics at Center for Studies in Social Sciences. Calcutta. It is in the center he actually established a, a, a branch, a public finance branch, and uh, um, in fact, um, they have been holding a lot of conferences and, and the like from there. He is the editor of South Asia Journal of Macroeconomics and Public Finance. In the past, he has served as a vice chancellor of the University of Calcutta and the director of uh, Center for Studies in Social Sciences. He has taught economics at the City University of Hong Kong, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, Jadavpur University, and Monash University in Australia. He has also held visiting positions in economics departments in the United States, Hong Kong, and Singapore. He has done his BA in economics from Presidency College, MA from Calcutta University, and PhD from the University of Rochester. His research interests include international economics, economic development, economics of corruption and governance, banking and finance, rational choice models of political economy, and with this, tax policy and reforms. <laughs> um, with this, uh, without any further ado, let me invite uh, Professor Sugata Marjit to make his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Govindra, and uh, thanks to the uh, organizers, uh, uh, the Center for uh, Economic Policy or Public Finance, uh, the ADRI, uh, IGC, uh, who have been kind enough to invite me to give my to to deliver, invite me to deliver this talk, <clears throat> uh, and uh, you you note the title of the conference is Theory, Practice and Challenges of Public Finance. So my paper would actually talk all about all these three aspects. So it would be a theoretical paper primarily, uh, although basically based on um, or implications for applied work. And it's about uh, uh, the, ex the actual practice of public finance as well as well as we talk about challenges uh, that we face today in terms of designing public finance policies. Um, <clears throat> so this particular paper, which is collaborated uh, by Shondip Sharkar of Xavier University, Bhuvaneshwar, and Lei Yang of Hong Kong Polytech, uh, deals with a concept which is called distribution neutral fiscal policy. Uh, and it follows up with two other recent works in which um, I had collaborations uh, with uh, Sanjeev Gupta, of, of formerly of IMF, and now it's a working paper of the IMF this year, early this year. Also, a theoretical consequence of that paper, which is uh, very nicely formalized and, uh, and, and worked on, um, 
along with us by Professor Anjan Mukherjee. And this is the third in this series. So let me just first tell you, I think I have given the idea of distribution neutral fiscal policy as a paper, I've given it in many places here and abroad, but I'll just reiterate what, you know, basic motivation comes because rising inequality within nations is a widely recognized empirical phenomenon. And uh, along with the decline in inequality among nations, if you, if you look at uh, the recent empirical evidence and, you know, empirical evidence in economics is such where people usually do not agree on the final outcome because people might say it's a consequence of the data or methodology or as such. But if you look at the work of uh, both IMF uh, as a world organization, as many others, generally now there is a consensus that inequality among nations somehow have subsided to some extent, but inequality within nations is what is very important. In fact, IMF has a big volume on it, published in 2015, uh, fiscal policy and inequality, as well as uh, some other, uh, I would say, interesting works like the, the book by Richard Baldwin called The Great Convergence, in which Baldwin argues that how the share of GDP of, of a, a, a number of countries uh, in the developing world now, share of world GDP is now quite substantial and respectable compared to what it was before. But Whatever it is, we know that rising inequality, you know, it used to be uh, thought about problems of the developing world mainly, but now this has caused huge amount of uh, political uproar and different kinds of problems in countries uh, which were, uh, of course, they were concerned about inequality, but these, these countries were not talking about inequality to, to, to that extent even 10, 20 years ago. But now what you see that developed countries, rich nations, uh, are moving away from, let's say, quote unquote, free trade or, or, or free immigration or some sort of unrestricted immigration or more liberal policy towards immigration. We see the rise of such concerns in terms of Brexit and, and Donald Trump's policies. And people started talking about that uh, uh, that things are not as good as they used to be and the developed countries themselves are going against what they always used to preach to countries like India, for example, in 60s, when, when we studied um, economics in mid-70s or late, uh, early 80s, we found that, you know, we would be always, you know, reading this, this uh, uh, stories of conflict where the developed countries are talking about that India should open up much more and uh, then there is this, the, the criticism of infant industry protection, import substitutes, etc. So it seems that developed countries were, the, were in fact the, uh, the proponents of the free world and, and we were kind of inward looking and so on. But situation has so much changed today that we actually talk about same policies now, not, even if not in terms of the standard import substituting industrialization, but it is import substitution nonetheless. Otherwise, there won't, there won't be any trade war between United States and China. So that is, that's why inequality is an important issue. And what is distribution neutral fiscal policy? It is how fiscal policy, by fiscal policy we mean taxes and transfers, uh, has fiscal policy failed to contain inequality? or what will be the performance monitor of fiscal policy so far as inequality is concerned. Now, any theoretical paper, the objective turns out to be very narrow and focused because otherwise we cannot handle all questions. So, these questions that if we look at rising inequality anywhere, you know, so it's like a methodology issue, and it, it so happens that it's applicable now to UK or US or, you know, other countries. The issue is, suppose you observe your inequality is going up in some measures, and in fact, as you may know that, uh, uh, you know, more sort of acceptable, recognized and, and well-recognized measures like Lawrence, Gini or Atkinson's measure or different other types, you would always find that they are basically talking about relative income. You know, essentially it's a relative measure. So the question is that, that suppose we observe that these have, uh, you know, the inequalities on the rise. The, there's a question of whether fiscal policy was doing enough. Now it is quite possible that fiscal policy was doing enough and still inequality was on the rise. But, so the question therefore leads to 
what would be the taxes and transfers that you would actually impose to keep the distribution unchanged? So if you're comparing two time periods, let's say, you know, 2008 and 2015, then you try to look at, you know, if you look at 2008 distribution and you look at 2015, if the distribution has worsened, the question that you ask yourself is that suppose the, you know, the government was, or authorities were bent on keeping the distribution intact, then what kind of taxes and transfers they would impose and how that would be different from what they're actually imposing now, what actually they're doing now. So if they are, theoretically speaking, exactly the same, then you know that the distributional you know, uh, neutrality is maintained, but typically that won't be, won't be the case. So then you try to question that what has gone wrong, that why the government was not able actually to pursue the policy such that the inequality will not change and at least the social unrest or political unrest or agitations or opposition, you know, oppo opposition's uh, aggressive stances could be content to some extent because you would always say, yes, people are, you know, it's, it's true that in the society, you know, people are possibly, they should have been much better off, but this relative position seems to be the, the same. The problem, uh, of, not of this approach, but inequality comes, uh, the, the, there, is, there is another problem that is attached to inequality, and the problem is that, and um, so it is essentially our concept of what do you mean by welfare in standard economic theory, you know? The welfare comes as of, in terms of absolute increase in, in income or utility or welfare. So we say that, okay, let's, let's follow Pareto and let's say that, that things have changed. Now people have done very, you know, there are, there's classes of people which have done outstanding and there are other classes who are not worse off. See, as an economist, we should be very happy because Pareto criterion has been satisfied because nobody is worse off and some people are better off. But the society does not look at it as a large chunk of the society can find it very difficult to sustain this because the society might think that, yes, I might have grown a bit, I might have done a little better, but look at the rest of the society. It has just gone past me. It has just shot, their welfare has shot through the roof. The, therefore, people, at, even at an individual level, are concerned about inequality. So it's not really that you put an inequality index in social welfare function because you are a magnanimous government and you want to be a benevolent in this spot and you try to see, no, I have done anything, everything right, but we have to fix up inequality. People would be irritated by the fact that if they find that, uh, you know, either in their social neighborhood or somewhere, they find that they are sort of lagging behind. It does not matter whether they have improved themselves, but actually the society just is leaving them, uh, you know, stranded at some place. So inequality, therefore, has, you know, problems which are beyond, you know, simple looking at the index and fixing it up, because essentially it creates political problem. It creates social unrest. People are not happy. So that's why this has, uh, I think, this idea of actually whether you can tackle inequality in a quantitative sense becomes even more important because you are trying to contain, you know, some degree of social unrest, political unrest. So in our first work, uh, which is where we considered this, this approach and we looked at very simple, you know, uh, uh, tax and transfer schemes, which do not have distortions, of course. That's why this paper is with distortions. And there we, we, we showed how it would, a distribution neutral fiscal policy theoretically would always exist. That is, if the taxes and transfers do not have distortions, then the government, any government should be able to do it. And then we gave examples what is happening, let's say in the United States or in India. You know, just these two simple examples we provided in that paper. And we showed that at least in case of United States, the, top, the topmost income bracket should be taxed at a much higher rate if they want to keep the inequality of the base period, what we took probably just a two to three years gap or something like that. But that was just an example. We are not making a value judgment about how the government actually worked. And then in the later paper where we discussed, um, you know, along with Anjunda and, and Sandeep Sarkar, what we did, we tried to characterize that our, uh, in the context of Pareto criterion, that we choose uh, a point that uh, on the contract curve, you know, for economists here, and essentially what we do, we, we, we have a selection criteria for Pareto non-comparable points on the contract curve, 
And there is single, there is a unique point, which is distribution neutral, which means that all these Pareto non-comparable points, so that we talk about, you know, shifting, uh, you know, do ta doing taxes such a way that redistribution takes us, you know, from one equilibrium to the other, we can actually say that there is one particular point where distribution is neutral. No other point is better than that in terms of distribution. So that, that's whatever we, we did. Now, this particular paper uh, is about... Uh, Uh, and I'm, I'm just keeping some of the theoretical thing and coming directly to the paper. Um, lower, you know, so now what we're going to do is bringing in distortionary taxes and transfers. Now, what is distortionary taxes? Everybody knows because I tax you saying that you are making 100 rupees extra, so I'm going to put some taxes on you, extra taxes maybe. But I also take this feedback that if I impose too much taxes on you so that you want to maintain the inequality, you know, my incentive to earn that 100 rupees will go down the drain because of the obvious reasons that my incentive is affected. So I cannot just go because, uh, to, to the people and say that, okay, because I'm, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an equality sort of uh, loving government, so let me try to make the society equal. And therefore, doesn't matter. I'm going to, you know, impose as much taxes as possible, give as much transfer to the, those who have not benefited by growth or trade or some sort of uh, expansion. So, but I cannot do that because if this is internalized by people, then actually you have to, you know, think thrice before you impose that tax. So this incentive effects have been talked about in many contexts. I, what we do, we bring in incentive effects or disincentive effects, whatever you call it, and um, into the taxation and, ta and also in transfers because typically transfers helps can have incentive effects also, which is in the wrong side or on the, on the right side. And we try to see whether, you know, how one can implement a distribution neutral fiscal policy. In fact, uh, one issue that is important, that is, we have to, uh, you know, what we are trying to stress is not that the government won't make an attempt to reduce inequality. Because, of course, every, every government's wish list, uh, there, is a, there is a big thing in the wish list, is that we want to con not only contain inequality, but we want to have to have a little more equal society. But the borderline of that, that you don't allow the inequality to actually jump up. So basically we're looking at the borderline, but essentially there can be a range of taxes and transfers which actually look at, you know, a declining uh, you know, environment of inequality. And we'll, come, we'll talk about that a little, but to, to pin it down to this neutral level tells you the minimum that you can do to contain inequality. So uh, there are some interesting outcomes when you try to find out the tax transfer rates which are, which are going to, uh, uh, which, which would be the distribution neutral rates. First of all, uh, you can easily see that since it's a constrained outcome, you know, distribution neutral fiscal policy may not be possible when you have too much of bad effects, you know, dis, you know incentive effects or too much distortionary effect. But suppose you could design such taxes and transfers, what would be the characteristic of the taxes and transfers? That is, what we show is the following, that if you start from a very sort of a relative, a sort of low degree of inequality, lower degree of inequality, then it is tougher for you to implement that. So in a way, it is interesting because uh, as the model tells you that initially if you have a low degree of inequality, and suppose your inequality has shot up through the roof and you want to bring it down, then you are in a worse position relative to some where the inequality was not very high. Ah, sorry, where the inequality was relatively high. This is a result which tells you that if you go to the, uh, to, to the, to the real, uh, real ground level and try to look at the data, then it might be the case that countries which have a lower inequality, let's say period 1980, in fact, or 1990, we have a simple data set we'll show you later, uh, then that particular, and, and the country has a higher, higher degree of inequality at that time, then the growth of inequality would be greater for the lower, the country with a lower degree of inequality. And the growth of inequality would be lower for a country which has a higher degree of inequality. Which means that you should, you should observe other things remaining the same, because the two other important issues is your growth rate, that is how your, you know, the class whom you are going to tax is increasing in terms of uh, its income, and also 
the current inequality which you aren't going to tackle because if the inequality is really very high, it's it's problem. Given other things, this would mean there is some sort of a convergence hypothesis going on in the sense that, you know, low inequality, bracket you can read, high income countries, they will have a tougher time in containing inequality than high inequality, low income countries, basically. So let me just, uh, uh, again, this particular diagram is not really, uh, I'm not trying to say that it's exactly corroborating my model, but it just, it's a data that you can, anybody can access from the POFCAL data of the World Bank site and you can actually calculate. So this is between 1990 and 2016, what we have done, we have looked at change in inequality uh, on the y-axis and initial degree of inequality. Now, the initial degree of inequality may vary because, you know, you may not have data for all countries of 1990, you may have some data for 1995 or 1997 or something like that as the initial point. Now, so this is statistically 100% not perfect, but whatever you do, the way you want to do it, and you compare, you compare the growth compared to the initial state of inequality, you, will, you are bound to get a downward sloping line, which says that low, in, low inequality countries are experiencing a higher, higher degree of inequality. In fact, if you look, if you, if you take this data and plot, for example, in 80s, for example, what was the inequality that was being experienced by the countries in the world? And let's say in 2000, what is the inequality that's being, so, so, and you plot them too, you won't get a 45 degree line. You'll find some countries are above 45 degree, which means inequality has gone up to some large extent. And there are some countries which are actually below 45 degree line, where within country inequality has either not gone up to that extent and actually fallen to some extent. So if you look at that, the, this is the heterogeneous response of countries, you know. And uh, basically, uh, therefore, the, the question therefore is that to look at, you know, how this, you know, the model is very simple. Uh, I will also the, tell you the sketch or the outline of the general proof, but that might not be interesting all of you, but I'll, so what I'm trying to do is that there are two classes of people, okay, rich and the poor. Now, what is the, dis the you know, distinction between rich and the poor is that uh, poor has lower income than the rich, and uh, the growth rate of income for the rich is much higher than the poor. So, these are the two characteristics that I divide this economy into two class economy. So, there are two conditions that you have to satisfy. The condition one is, when I tax the rich, uh, it has two effects. First of all, the after-tax income is coming down, of course, and also, the rate itself has an effect on the income income level. So this captures a broad, uh, you know, this, this summary inform, uh, you know, uh, summary uh, symbol actually or, or construct captures a large body of research on how you model distortion. You know, I'm not going to model uh, distortionary effects in a very specific form. It is essentially affecting the, the income of the people whom you are taxing. Now, whether they are actually, their labor supply is falling back, that's why they don't want to work, or there are some other incentive problems, we are not going to discuss that. We want to know that W1 prime is less than zero. As you put more tax, these guys think, you know, their, their earning capacity actually goes down. Maybe voluntary, maybe involuntary, we are not going to discuss that. Now, the two persons, so basically you have tax, say, the total amount of tax that you collect, you give it to the other guy. So that's your transfer. Now that chap gets the extra income, but its wage also is sensitive to this transfer. And that may have positive and negative effects. Because if you go by the recent work on, people talk about this universal basic, you know, UB, universal basic income. So you give extra income to the poor people, how they're going to use it. Or for example, give them some assets, for example. How they're going to do it. That there's a class of economists who argue, or a you know, group, a very influential group, they argue that, if you give something to the poor just like that, they, you know, they would be utilizing it, they will invest some part of it, they will consume some part of it, and they may act, that might actually improve their long run situation. And then there are issues that we also confront in this country in the point that if you give, for example, the story of Norega is not really uniform across countries. You know, there are situations where, where people actually have abstained from work. Because, because this, this has not created any public assets or, or anything. So Norega has its leakage, has its problems also. So we don't focus on how exactly this W2 will behave. We just say there may be positive or negative effects. Okay. So what you require is that 
a tax rate must satisfy this both. That is on one hand, the after tax inequality has to fall or remain the same. And the tax rate should not be high more than that critical amount, which actually takes away all the income from these guys, right? So that initially, so the first constraint and the second constraint, if both are satisfied, you know, this policy is feasible. Now, which tax will you choose? How would you choose it? That's a separate issue. So we just plot these two, and I'll, I'll just, if you look at the figure here, and you can easily see that T bar is the highest tax rate that you can impose, and T star is at least you have to impose so that inequality remains the same. So if T star, so there is a gap between T star and T bar, then it's feasible, because you can choose any tax rate between T star and T bar, and you would be able to implement distribution neutral fiscal policy. In fact, T star is your distribution neutral point. For any tax that is below in T bar and above T star, you can actually reduce the inequality also. So this is possible. In fact, this shows the feasibility of it, but it is, one can prove that that, that may not be true at all. But one interesting exercise that one can do, that suppose we start from a lower degree of inequality. So this is where, so you can think of India as the blue line and United Kingdom as the green line in 1990, okay? Because UK had a much lower inequality than India. Then the tax rates with which UK can play around are actually smaller than the tax rate with which India can play around. India can tax more than UK and still be able to implement this distribution neutral policy. But UK cannot. The, this argument is essentially, if you start from very low degree of inequality or relatively low degree of inequality, you are starting from here and inequality has gone up there. You are trying to pull down so that you, you want to make it level as, as the low degree. So lower it is, you have to pull it down more. And if you have to pull it down more, you have to actually impose more taxes. But more taxes has both negative effect on, on, on tax base as well as the, the amount that you take out from tax. So other things remaining the same, having a low degree of inequality is not really, to start with, is not really a very good sort of initial condition for, to, for you to control, to, to be able to, to, to implement this distribution neutral policy. Okay, and in fact, with that, what you and then if you solve for T star from that figure two, where you know where you look at that intersection, and and uh, the T star is a function of three variables. One is the growth rate of income. The other growth rate of income here is of course growth rate of the uh, you know top income earners. Then initial inequality I not and the inequality that is currently you observe and you want to cut it down. So that's your that's your I1. And when your growth rate is, is, uh, is higher, then you can afford to tax lower amount and still you know, implement this policy. When your inequality is, is high, then what happens is, your, if your I0 is high, still you can reduce that so that your range expands because you can actually impose a lower tax rate. And then, if your initial, in, your, your ultimate inequality, that is the inequality you want to, you know, if that is pretty high, then of course you have to impose a very high tax rate. And imposing higher tax rate has this problem of that you are going to that critical level of T bar. That is, if you impose too much of tax, you know, high tax, then your income generating function is affected. So, if we just, you know, concentrate on this, this idea of, what the fiscal policy, in a, in a very, I would say in a very basic sense, fiscal policies are essentially uh, uh, policies like taxes, transfers, or whatever, they have a, a budget constraint. So here we are always on the balanced budget criterion, so I'm not allowing the government to actually run a deficit or anything. But it's a balance, it's, it's a kind of has a budget constraint. Government knows that, okay, I have $100 to redistribute. Okay. First, you decide on this hundred dollars or hundred rupees. How do you decide that? By imposing taxes and so on. Now, if you have to, you have to take a welfare criterion, and if you really take inequality seriously, then you have to figure out that I won't allow inequality to go beyond a certain level. 
Then you choose your tax rates. That will, in this model, give you surplus with which you'll have to work. And you have to check whether, to what extent, you can use fiscal policy to address this problem of inequality. Now, people talk about that, you know, you have to transfer to the poor, you have to transfer to the disadvantaged, you have to transfer to someone. But actually, transfer, definitely, but it comes from taxes or resources that you raise from somewhere, right? So the question is, to what extent you will transfer, whether that would be consistent with your objective, in the sense that you may actually try to transfer a lot, either it will put a pressure on your, or your budget, and the, the, the point is that you may need, need to do something else. The fiscal policy itself will not do it. Because if you really want to raise taxes and do it, then you are actually affecting the incentive structure of population. Now, whether it is happening in one country and it is not happening in the other, whether New Zealand is doing it better or, or Italy is, is not doing it, or India is doing it, you know, good. In fact, India and U US comparison we had, uh, it was good to see that, that so far as this simple exercise is concerned, that India has done better than US, but that, but that, that needs further, further uh, uh, analysis. So, so the problem, therefore, is whether fiscal policy can address this issue and how far it is addressing this issue, this con can con you know, be considered as a fiscal performance, mon as, as, a, as a fiscal monitor. So if I have a distribution of tax and transfer rates that are consistent with the distribution neutral fiscal policy, and then I have actual tax transfer rates, and the statistical distributions can be compared. There are methods where you talk about how different are these distributions. If these distributions are very close, then you know that fiscal policy is doing its, you know, it doing, it doing a great job, but that may not be enough. There may be other social issues there. But if these, these two distributions are far apart, it means that there, probably government could have done something, and, and the government possibly has not done it. And there may be other reasons for that. Well, I, I'm not, you know, making any judgment, but this can be used as a fiscal monitor, as a fiscal performance index for the governments, for, for, for authorities who, who, so far as inequality, inequality is concerned. Now, as I said, the proof is not, con, you know, is, con, is not restricted to this two-class economy. I'll just sketch the proof before I just finish. So you can have a, a, two distributions and you can, you can, uh, you know, what you try to uh, figure out what is the maximum tolerable cost so that the distribution neutral fiscal policy is implemented. So you can have n number of people. And then what you compare, you compare two distributions where they are everything, everywhere they are the same. But you, you in one distribution, you redistribute from uh, low income to high income so that you make the distribution regressive. And then you compare the maximum tolerable cost of this distribution. You will find that where it is little, it's more regressive, your tolerable cost, which is, you know, total tax that you impose, is actually lower, that you can actually, you know, impose lower taxes and get away by, by implementing this policy. So the, but this proof is, again, is for our, you know, theoretical or, or, or sort of uh, a kind of um, academic uh, satisfaction. But the point is, is basically as simple as the, as, as the fact that if you are starting from a low inequality and you want to preserve that, it's a hell of a task. Because, and if your income distribution in the process has become really skewed, then to bring it back to that level, it's tough. So that's why uh, if someone is thinking about it and sort of looking at this paper, one way of actually trying to see that it's capturing reality to some extent, the idea that uh, uh, if you have done well in the past in terms of inequality, and for some reason you could not contain its, its skewness in recent years or something like that, you would be in a tough you know, kind of a world to contain it. And then all, all hell might break loose, and it might show a lot of social unrest and, and political unrest and so on and so forth. So, so basically, uh, this particular paper was written as a as sort of a reflection on Brexit and the general attitude of the of the of the Western world in terms of 
uh, uh, less free trade, less free migration and so on and more sort of uh, inward looking policies. But it turns out that we can actually apply, in fact in England there is a group of economists who are trying to apply it now in terms of British, with, with British data which has very good data on uh, taxes and net of net taxes, net of transfers and so on to, to see that how, what is the fiscal index for, for, uh, for uh, monitoring uh, performance, performance for, for UK and also there is someone in US, there's a group who's trying to do it, you know, basically at the tenure of presidents of United States and trying to see, you know, to what extent fiscal policy performed in terms of keeping the inequality in check. Um, so, uh, so that is the paper and we hope to apply it empirically in other countries and, and do more exercises with that and trying to explain this, this idea that, you know, what the, the connection of fiscal policy to inequality in which there are other empirical papers which have worked on that. But I think that um, uh, as, as different types of fiscal policies and their impact on inequality is an interesting way of looking at how inequality can be addressed in terms of quantitative models. Um, so hopefully something else will come out of it also and some more applied stuff will, will come out. Um, so um, thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> friends, I think we have some time for questions. And um, um, if uh, I'd like to ask people to, Romer. So, Gata, I was wondering whether it was required for you to conflate the growth status with the inequality parameter in your initial conditions. So, low inequality goes with a high growing economy and high inequality necessarily grows, goes with a low growth economy? Yeah. Uh, to start, the initial conditions, the two things hang together. Do they need to? Yeah. Uh, Actually, though I have taken growth and inequality are two different uh, parameters because we are talking about just measurements. Uh, but the problem is not very, you know, isolating them in a very systematic way is not very, uh, is not a very easy task because you see uh, the countries, some of the countries which had very, you know, inequality wise, they are quite, uh, you know, high degree of inequality, but really have grown very fast, right? So, uh, and there are countries with, with, with low degree of inequality, you know, typically the developed countries have not grown much compared to the, you know, those, uh, the other countries and so on. What I'm trying to suggest... You, you don't need it for your model, that's all I want. No, no, I don't need, I don't need any, any sort of growth inequality relationship or anything because I work with these numbers that I have. But it's an interesting way of looking at uh, the problem because countries, there are countries who have a high growth and high degree of inequality. And of course, their current inequality can also be pretty high, but on both these counts, they're in an advantageous position to actually, you know, sort of contain this inequality, rise in inequality. Thank you. Professor Marjit for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm a layperson to this area, but I had a, a question came to my mind, which was actually, and I would like your views on it. I know Professor Govinda Rao is also um, uh, sort of an expert in this. Um, it's, the, my question is this, that if we sort of just kind of extrapolate a little bit to the Indian context in the federal, in the Indian federal structure, to what extent do you think inequality within state inequality could be a criteria for the, fed, uh, for the center to take into account and build in as part of a fiscal performance index or whatever, when it is dis deciding on center state allocations? Yes, it's a very relevant question. Uh, I think uh, the f it's, it's, it's an issue of fiscal federalism and Professor Govind Rao sitting next to me is the <laughs> 
most well-known expert on that issue, but let me try to contextualize your question in, in terms of my... You see, if you interpret my model, that would be like, there is no center state distinction. It would be like, for example, take a state like Bihar. Then I would consider the center and the state government as the single unit, the fiscal authority. Bihar government is generating some resources. Central government is giving some resources to Bihar. That would be the government, which has a set of res a kind of total amount of resources, right? And both these governments may be engaging in some sort of welfare programs, right? I mean, for example, there are many such development programs in which there are partial, you know, contributions and so on. There are also, you know, sole contributions of the state, etc. So that would be considered as the transfers, right? And there is a budget constraint, and then I will evaluate. And then I will say that whether government has been able to do it or government has used fiscal policy. Now, this government is not the government of Bihar, neither it's the government of center. It is essentially the political authorities which are mobilizing resources. Resources are coming from either from taxation or borrowing or somewhere. And then they are using that resources to, to, for welfare programs or, or programs which you know, of course, these are not really dole money, but these are going to have impact on inequality. It is, it is, it is expected, or poverty, you know, that may have impact on inequality. So then we will try to compare that. So it is, I, I cannot give you a, a, a kind of answer in terms of how it would be, you know, what is, whose responsibility is this? My model doesn't say anything about it. Well, friends, I think uh, um, <clears throat> there has been, uh, you know, in fact, um, Professor Marjit has tried to work out the appropriate mix of uh, tax transfer policies to ensure distribution neutral. The point that comes out is that it's not just the direct impact that matters, but then because of the a particular tax measure, there will be indirect impact arising from the incentives. And um, so that could impact on the income generation and that could in turn uh, result in changes in the income distribution. And therefore it is necessary to look at the general equilibrium effects and, and then see how this, um, this is how, this is what I understand um, from the thing. In that sense of the term, you know, there may be a very serious uh, poverty alleviation intervention in terms of the transfers. Now, it, I mean, it's quite possible that these poverty alleviation interventions because of the indirect effects on the income generation can result in, you know, in, in, can blunt to an extent. Um, you know, the inc increase in the incomes of the rich need not necessarily increase the incomes of the poor. Basically, or or reducing the incomes of the rich may not increase the incomes of the poor. I and mean, basically that's the... So it's important to... I mean, this is a very interesting, uh, you know, presentation. And um, I think it's the next stage is I think we need to really work out the empirics of it uh, to ensure a, appropriate policy mix, even for poverty interventions, anti-poverty interventions. And, and this is what... This is my takeaway from this particular paper. And I'm sure there will be more uh, empirical work from, uh, as we go along, from Professor Sugata Marjit and his group. Um, since um, there are no further interventions, let me stop this here and thank you very much. And um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very thought out, very well thought out paper. And then I'm sure there will be a lot more of uh, work Okay, please. Mr. Marjit, that was very interesting. I'm sorry I didn't understand the mathematics, but one simple question, I mean, one argument that's often made is that the rich are employers of the poor. So how does that fit into this model? I mean, do you have some sort of a, an employer-employee framework in this model to go with this um, approach that you have? Uh, 
Yes, actually, uh, the wage formation story, that is how or the income generation story, other than income is affected by the tax rate or transfer rates, is not modeled here. So yes, of course, there is as such no link up between the rich and the poor or the high income to, to, to low income. Uh, but you see, uh, that itself uh, will not clutter the model that much because essentially what happens is what you look at is the, in, the net income of these classes. So even if there is some economic relationship between the rich and the poor, you can always look at, at the end of the day, the income levels of these groups. So that income is essentially the net income of the rich, the net income of the poor. And this may have, you know, there, that may have transcended many, many layers and so on. So, but the main point that, which is related to Professor Rao's uh, remark is essentially how really that uh, function that transfers affect the income generation process, in the taxes affect the income generation process, the leakage of the system, all of these are very important because that will tell you that maybe we are taxing people a lot, but the poor people's income are not rising. That is, that is something you know, that, that we have to actually bring into some, some sort of our exercise. But so far as employer-employee relationship, I don't think it, it, has, it, it clutters my model, it does anything uh, in, in sort of the, to the result. Yeah. yeah, no, I think empirical modeling of this particular thing is a big challenge. Yeah, because um, you know, at, at high levels of um, taxes on the capital, there will be, you know, sort of a lot of mobility of capital. And that's um, when you have, the, when the capital moves out, I mean, internationally, then, you know, it could have a very significant impact on this thing. Like that's Europe, basically Europe the, precisely. Basically European Union has precisely, been. that's, uh, that's, so, I mean, uh, but then the point, general of. point is, general point is very well taken. And I think uh, this is a, a very interesting paper, paper, and I think we should all, uh, you know, give him a big hand. Thank you very much. We thank